All right, we're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to get started. Greetings and thank you for attending this month's science seminar presented by the NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, which is operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and NEON. We are excited to have a dual presentation today by Adriana Oskanga and Nayani. Oh, I don't have the last name in front of me. I'm going to let our next um, presenter introduce their names very perfectly. Um, Nayani and Adriana are our dual presenters. We're very excited for their talks today. But before we turn it over to those fantastic speakers, I want to go through a few logistics. So we have enabled optional automated closed captioning for today's talk. If you would like to use it, find the CC button in your Zoom menu bar. The webinar will consist of a presentation, actually two presentations, followed by Q&A. And we're gonna do a short Q&A after each presentation and then try to leave a little time for more of an integrated QA, maybe uh, reaching across themes that touch both talks at the very end of the session. So as you think of questions, please put them into the Q&A box. We also have a meeting chat, which you're welcome to use to share links or other items of interest, but add questions for the speakers into the Q&A. We'll facilitate discussion of those questions at the end of each talk and also at the end of the presentation. And there is also an opportunity to ask questions over audio by using the raise hand feature if you prefer. NEON welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation as outlined in our NEON code of conduct. This applies to NEON staff as well as anyone participating in a NEON event. The full code of conduct is available via a link that I will share in the chat in a moment and is also embedded in the Science Seminars webpage, which I am showing on my screen. And I will also share that link with you in a moment. This talk will be recorded. These two talks will be recorded and made available for later viewing on the NEON Science Seminars webpage. If you scroll down here to the list of talks, you can see that once a talk is passed, we soon thereafter make this recording available link um, appear, and those will take you to the recordings of the seminars. To complement our monthly NEON Science seminars, we host related data skills webinars on how to access and use NEON data. Registration for those is available on the same science webinars webpage. If you just go to the bottom beneath the list of talks, you come to the list of data skills webinars. Uh, later this month, we're having a very relevant webinar on remote sensing of wildfire impacts. So if that is of interest to anyone, again, I'll drop the link in the chat in a moment. We would love to see you at that data skills webinar later in March. And lastly, if you have ideas for a talk for this science, for this seminar series, nominate yourself or a colleague today by filling out the form on our science seminars webpage. It's here near the top, nominate a seminar speaker. We would love to hear from you. So that's it for me. I'll turn it over to John Masinski to introduce our fantastic lineup of speakers. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, I'm John Masinski. I'm a remote sensing scientist with uh, the Airborne Remote Sensing Group. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Adriana Uskanga, who will be our first speaker. Adriana is a postdoctoral researcher working with Dr. Kyla Dahlin at the Ecological Remote Sensing and Modeling Lab in the Department of Geography at Michigan State University. Adriana is a landscape ecologist who integrates field and remote sensing data to analyze patterns of vegetation change over space and time, investigating their impact on carbon dynamics and biodiversity. Adriana earned an undergraduate degree in biology and a master's degree in ecology and evolution at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She went on to earn a PhD in geography from the University of Oregon, where she analyzed the interacting effects of environmental gradients and land use intensity on tropical forest structure and tree diversity. Currently, her interdisciplinary work seeks to improve our understanding of the influence that disturbance, land use, and land management have on forest structure, composition, and function across scales. So without further ado, please welcome Adriana Uskanga. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. I will um, share my screen with you all. There, I hope you can all see that. 
Uh, so my name is Adriana, and today I'm going to share with you uh, part of the project I've been working on with Dr. Kyla Darling at the Ecological Remote Sensing and Modeling Lab in the Department of Geography at Michigan State University. And the main focus of this project has been to characterize vegetation change over time or disturbance trajectories to improve forest structural models that in turn help us to make better predictions of forest carbon uptake. And for that, we've been using NEON sites and Landsat data. So let's begin with some um, definitions first. Um, Forest, uh, when we think about forest structure, we're referring to the 3D arrangement of trees and other plants. And we measure forest structure with variables such as leaf area index, or um, which is the area of leaves per unit ground, or variables such as canopy height, which is the height of the trees, canopy rugosity, which is um, a measure of um, how complex is a canopy in a forest. And there are many other variables of forest uh, structural attributes that we can, we can measure in the forest. And we care about these forest structural, structural attributes because they are um, relevant in for different um, forest ecological processes and dynamics. So for instance, uh, researchers have found that a higher um, complexity in canopies is related to higher um, biodiversity in the forest, for instance. Um, understanding forest structure is also important for understanding the cycling of water or, or the water cycle in general. And perhaps um, more important for us, um, forest structure is very related to how much carbon a uh, forest can um, take up and sequester. So if we think about how leaves and trees are arranged over space. We can, for example, we can visualize how different, um, that will change how different leaves can intercept uh, sunlight and in turn how those leaves can um, make photosynthesis and um, uptake carbon from the atmosphere, for instance. And uh, just to give you an example of how forest structure is related to um, this very important functional uh, processes that take place in, in forests. So um, really understanding um, the spatial distribution and spatial patterns of forest structure is really important for us to uh, improve our understanding of uh, this ecological process and uh, specifically carbon dynamics. So these two forest structure and for forest function are very related. And forest structure is determined by abiotic conditions such as climate, soil, and topography of a forest, but also by um, historical processes, by the history of that forest, such as the disturbance of a forest. For instance, if a forest had a, there was like a fire in a forest, it will have a different structure than a forest with no disturbances. Um, land use and land management are also important for de determining a forest structure and succession, which is basically uh, how vegetation grows after a disturbance. And in general, when we think about um, the models we have for modeling forest structure, um, we actually, models make a pretty good job at including abiotic conditions such as climate, soil, and topography, but they don't, uh, many models do not include um, these um, variables related to the history of a forest. So we don't have um, models in general lack this, um, this part of like variables related to disturbance that are included into, into the models. Um, so that's what we are being we've been working on in this project. And part of this is because um, there is this general idea that disturbance and land use is only or are only relevant at very local scales. 
Uh, but actually, there has been a lot of research showing that disturbance and land use are also relevant, um, not only at local scales, but also at larger extents, such as regional, continental, and even global scales. So if we think about that um, there's about like 60% of the forest around the world has been modified by humans, then it kind of naturally follows that um, we probably have a large effect on how on like this 3D arrangement of plants um, around the world. But the other challenge in um, including disturbance or variables related to disturbance and land use into forest structural models is um, the data, the type of data we have for doing that. So. Um, Sometimes we use records of uh, records of past land use or ownership and forest inventories, uh, kind of to get that information of um, the history of a forest. But those are not always spatially explicit, so it it's difficult to understand the spatial distribution um, or to model the spatial distribution of forest structural variables with that that ex uh, spatially explicit data. And sometimes we use things like land cover maps, for instance, but they tend to be coarse and they um, simplify these very complex processes of disturbance and land use and succession. So what we really need is continuous data, data that represent the complexity of disturbance and land use processes with accuracy. And that's why we, in this project, we've been using a Landsat time series analysis. So for people that are not very familiar um, with uh, remote sensing and yeah, remote sensing technology in general, Landsat is this mission run by um, NASA that they have launched um, satellites from the 70s. So we have uh, actually Landsat is the longest record of the Earth's surface that we have publicly available today. And each satellite has a repeating cycle of two weeks and it has global coverage. So that means we actually have many images or we can get many images from um, all the forests around the world. And in this figure, uh, this is an example of um, one of these uh, Landsat time series where um, they basically stacked or they make a series of Landsat images ordered over time and they calculate a vegetation index to follow vegetation change over time. And in this example, you can see, for instance, um, that this forest in Oregon, um, there was a fire in the year 2002, represented here by these red colors. And then the authors could actually track how vegetation grew after that disturbance um, over time. So this is basically what we've been using for analyzing um, disturbance trajectories. So with that background in mind, the objective of this project is to improve forest structure predictions by integrating patterns of forest disturbance and recovery across time and space over the last around 40 years. So the idea is that using these um, disturbance trajectories um, and integrating these disturbance trajectories or data of these disturbance trajectories in our models, we can actually improve uh, models of forest structure. So th that's what we're testing in this project. And for that, we're using NEON um, data, so the National Ecological Observatory ne Network. And in particular, we're um, right now we're using, um, well, we're studying Harvard Forest because Harvard Forest has um, not only all the data that NEON people have collected in that forest, but also um, data on previous land management and um, disturbances and things like that. So um, as many of you probably know, NEON uh, collects or like, yeah, NEON people collect a lot of data in, in NEON sites, um, field data on the ground. They also have a um, flux tower in each site, but they also have an airplane with a LIDAR sensor and a hyperspectral uh, sensor, uh, which is great for us. So basically we've been um, mapping different forest structural variables using the LIDAR data from NEON. And today, the results I'm going to show you are um, just for leaf area index, but we've been also working with other forest structural variables, such as canopy height and canopy rugosity. 
So we've been using LIDAR for mapping leaf area index and uh, for the um, disturbance trajectories, we've been analyzing Landsat time series um, using three different vegetation indices, the normalized different vegetation index or NDVI, the normalized difference moisture index or NDMI, and the tessel cap wetness. Um, and to analyze this Landsat time series, we've been using this algorithm called LandTrender implemented in Google Earth Engine. So LandTrender is basically um, an algorithm, a segmentation algorithm. So it basically takes a time series and it splits that time series into different segments that are connected by vertices. And each vertex represents a change in trajectory. So a change in, in vegetation. Um, something that's really uh, important for us and like that we really like about using this is that um, this algorithm and this method is that it's um, we get information pixel wide, like by every pixel. So we get a uh, disturbance trajectory per pixel. And each segment has a magnitude, a duration, and a rate. So with that information, we can derive many disturbance metrics um, that we can later on use in our models. And disturbance metrics are things like the number of vertices in a time series, for example, or how many uh, disturbances there were in, in a time series. The time since last disturbance, the magnitude of vegetation um, decline, and there are many, many other um, disturbance metrics that we've been using and that, that we derive from land trender. So here I'm just showing three of, of these examples. Um, on the left, you can see um, if NDVI, for instance, grew in, in every pixel uh, along these like 40 years, in the middle, uh, it's the NDMI magnitude change. So basically, if NDMI increased or decreased over time, over like the 40 years of, of, of time of yeah time series, and also the standard uh, deviation of ND, NDMI over time on the, on the right in, in purple. But as I was saying, we have many of these. We derived 38 uh, disturbance metrics per index. So we ended up with a pretty large data set. So with that data set, um, we've been feeding models of, um, as I said before here, I'm just showing models for leaf area index, although we have um, done it also with canopy height and other uh, forest structural variables. And in these models, we include abiotic conditions, so information on soil and topography and uh, solar incoming radiation as well. And we also include the disturbance metrics. So just to give you an example of how that looks on like maps. Um, on the first row, there are some um, predictor variables related to topography and soil. Then we're also using the NDVI tessel cap wetness and NDMI for the year where data was collected, which is to the year 2018. And then uh, we're adding all the disturbance metrics we derived from uh, land trender. And we've been doing two different approaches, uh, modeling with uh, ordinary least squares regression, which is basically just uh, linear models. But we've been also feeding simultaneous autoregressive models, which are linear models that account for spatial autocorrelation, which is something um, that when you're analyzing uh, these geographic patterns, it's like it becomes really important. Uh, so basically, SAR models are linear models that include a term for like um, the the dist uh, distance mat uh, matrix between pixels, and that helps with um, yeah with for like accounting for spatial autocorrelation in the models. And we've modeling or like we've been feeding these models in like three different steps. We've been feeding these models only with abiotic variables, then with abiotic variables and adding um, the vegetation indices for the year where data was collected. And then with abiotic variables, the year, um, the vegetation indices for the year of data collection and the disturbance metrics. And we've been doing this to test whether this, uh, imp uh, including disturbance metrics actually improve the models or not. 
So here are um, some of the results um, for leaf area index. So in this scatter plots, I'm showing on the y-axis, the leaf area index, the observed values of uh, leaf area index on the y-axis, and then the fitted values for um, leaf area index on the x-axis. Um, with, as I was saying, in these three different steps, abiotic, abiotic and vegetation indices, and uh, also including the disturbance metrics on the third column, and with uh, linear models and SAR models on the two different rows. So in general, there are two main um, kind of results or like take home messages that we can take from these results. The first one is that SAR models make a better job at explaining, uh, in this case, leaf area index than just like simple linear models or um, ordinary least square regressions. And um, you can see this on the distribution of these points, uh, but also on the R squares of these different models. Um, and the second, so actually like including this term of like correcting for spatial autocorrelation improves the models a lot. Uh, the other main like kind of like big result or take home message from this from these results is that um, actually model performance improves when adding the disturbance metric. So as you can see uh, for both Lin, uh, ordinary least square regressions and SAR models. So for instance, for the ordinary least square regressions, the R square improves from like 0.13 to almost 0.5 when we include the disturbance metrics. And for the SAR models, even if the R squares between the model on using only abiotic variables and the model using also the disturbance metrics uh, is not that different. I want to draw your attention to this AIC value where you can see that AIC actually reduces or like declines a lot when we include the disturbance metrics. So uh, our results so far have shown that data on disturbance trajectories um, that we have measured through these disturbance metrics improve forest structural models. And although the results I'm showing here were only for leaf area index, we have seen the same um, kind of the same trend with other with other uh, forest structural variables. The predictors change with different forest structural variables, but it's uh, kind of the same trend where, where uh, SAR models work better than ordinary least square regressions and that adding disturbance metrics improve the models a lot. So we've been very happy with seeing these results. And um, in the future, we would actually like to, um, so these models have been very helpful for explaining the spatial distribution of forest structural attributes, uh, but we actually would like to make some predictive models to kind of use this similar approach, but actually to predict how forest structure could look like in other sites. Um, we would also like to and do this with planned functional traits using the hyperspectral data that NEON um, collects. And um, both for like, especially for the predictive models, it would be very interested to test the same approach at larger extents. So we plan to not only include other NEON sites also in temperate forests, but also use, uh, we would like to use these methods with like other forests. And especially we're very interested uh, in seeing if these methods um, hold true or that these are all also, um, yeah, if, if these methods hold true for other understudied regions. So regions where we, for instance, don't have that much information on the disturbance history and the land, uh, previous land use and land management, but also um, where we don't have, for instance, uh, airborne LIDAR and things like that. So we're very excited to be working with NEON sites where we have a lot of data to then being able to test these same approaches um, in, yeah, in understudied regions, such as tropical regions, for instance, that um, 
we yeah we we really need to to be working more on those on those areas and finally we've been also working on this idea of disturbance syndromes which is basically like a classification of the disturbance trajectories we've been analyzing across um across different ecosystems so that's um for future for yeah for the future uh future results um so finally, I would like to also announce that uh, we've been running this um, Spectral Ecology Summer School. Spec School is a school for uh, grad students and postdocs that are interested in uh, terrestrial ecology and remote sensing, and we use a lot of NEON data in this school so if you know someone that could be interested or, or if you're interested in joining uh we will open applications by the end of this year and we're currently running the second year of spec school and um the in-person portion of the school actually takes place in, in the mountain lake biological station which is also a neon site so um, yeah, fun times. If you're interested, please um, join or send your application and uh, spread the word. So with that, I would only uh, like to thank you for listening and also thank um, Kyla and people at the Airsum Lab, NSF Neon Landsat and um, the Landsat mission and Landtrender and Google Earth Engine for making this project possible. And with that, I think we do have a couple of minutes where I can take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adriana. It was a great presentation. <clears throat> yes, we do have a few minutes for um, questions before the next presentation. So please, um, if you didn't see the message in the chat from Samantha, add your uh, questions in the Q&A box. Um, yeah, the first question we have is, have you noticed differences between sites or forest types in the influence or disturbance on structure? So something uh, important in this project is that we're actually not um, kind of studying how different disturbances have different effects. Uh, most probably, I mean, if there is a fire in a forest that will have different effects than a pest outbreak, for instance, uh, on like how forest structure changes. Uh, we're not, since we're working, like the idea is to work um, at landscape regional continental scales uh, and make like a classification of these different uh, disturbances. We want to see whether um, different forests react similarly even if to, to like disturbances even if we don't know exactly which disturbance caused the or what was the cause of that disturbance um so yeah i don't know if that answers the question but that's what we're uh yeah that's what we've been trying to to do and we haven't compared these results or like these trends with different forests so i will look forward to, to do that uh, including like all other neon sites in this analysis. Okay, great. Hey, I think we have uh, time for one more question. Hi, Andrea, great talk. I was wondering if you use some sort of temporal interpolation for filling missing Landsat images due to cloud cover. No, that's an excellent question. So what uh, LandTrender does is um, instead of using all the images for like the whole year, uh, well, first of all, we do some like cloud screening and we do mask clouds uh, from these Landsat images, but we also uh, make a medioid uh, image, so a composite image just for like a couple of months. So we use June, July, August, I think, uh, for each year. So we don't use, so in that in that way, we kind of remove the seasonal variation and we also remove the um, effect of, of clouds or like cloud covering. Um, so that's what, what we've been using for, for the Landsat time series analysis. And I'm, yeah, I'm happy to, to talk more about that, that process later. Okay, great. We have a couple of more questions. Um, 
but uh, for the sake of time, what I'd like to do is save them to the Q&A session at the end of the, the talk and um, first give a chance to uh, Nayani to um, present, and then we can um, open the, the floor to all the questions uh, at that point forward. So uh, to those of you who put these, sent these questions in, thank you very much. We'll get to them in a few minutes. Thank, you. thank you very much, Adriana. Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nayani Ilankakun. Nayani is a research scientist at Earth Lab at the University of Colorado in Boulder. She earned her PhD in geosciences from Boise State University in 2020. Her background is in remote sensing applications of ecosystem ecology and forest diversity. Her recent projects include post-fire recovery and carbon potential in Western US conifer forests using JEDI space-borne LIDAR and unmanned aircraft systems, UASs. In addition, she works on model and algorithm development with JEDI data to estimate semi-arid ecosystem biomass density, implementation of UAS methods to understand post-disturbance vegetation regeneration, ecosystem transformations, and their impacts on carbon. Please welcome Nayani Ilgankakun. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. First, let me share my screen. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm very excited to talk to you today, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, so first, um, before I start my talk, I think I should um, acknowledge my funders, the NSF series and Earth Lab and also all my uh, contributors and collaborators for this research. Um, so I'm Laini Langakon. I'm a research scientist at EarthLab. So during this talk, I'm going to um, provide summary of some of the research that I did uh, past couple of years. Uh, they are all interconnected and mostly address the impact of forest uh, diversity and ecosystem transformation due to disturbance. And um, I have used uh, several remote sensing data sets from satellites, drones, neon data, as well as the drone uh, data. So my outline of talk, like I will briefly go through the Western US forest ecosystems and the forest disturbance, and then some of the research um, highlighted I did uh, on the disturbance and the impact on the disturbance. So uh, this two map shows the forest distribution in the Western US. And the first one is more to talk about the different forest types. And the image on the right uh, from the land change uh, monitoring assessment and projection data set, SEMAP data set. So particularly that data set uh, shows that distribution of all the land cover classes. And this map is from 1985. So we have that data set from 1985 to today. And I also overlaid uh, the fire data set. That's one of the major disturbance in the Western ecosystems. So you see like uh, there are a ton of fires happen in the Western uh, ecosystems, um, especially in the forested ecosystems. And so the overarching question is that how Western US forest ecosystems respond to disturbances. So in addition to fires, there are a ton of other different disturbances happens in the forest ecosystems, especially droughts, fires, uh, beetle kills, and also uh, climate warming, uh, and also like the invasion as well. Um, so the, the figure in the right, just to show that a conceptual figure that how we uh, see it, how what is our assumption on addressing the disturbance and the recovery? So this uh, state variable could be anything. It could be the carbon, it could be the uh, land cover, it could be a uh, leaf area index, or it could be anything. And so the, all these lines shows like what we uh, considered are the stable states, what's the uh, transition can happen during the disturbance and what if it's uh, if that ecosystem recovers, what's the uh, recovery trajectory look like? So for example, this green line with the uncertainty shows the recovering and then become into stable states after that. And also this yellow line uh, on the bottom of the uh, figure shows that if the uh, ecosystem is not recovering and maybe changing into an alternative state. So, um, 
I will talk more about fire today because um, most of my research um, lies around fires. And so the first thing is that post-fire recovery in the Western US. So the figure here is just to show like how many fires happened in the last 30, 40 years in the Western US forest ecosystems. So this record shows that both the number of fires and also the total burned area increases in the Western US. And um, so when we have that, and also, okay, it continually increases the frequency and the intensity, everything increases during the last um, couple of decades. So the question is like, what actually happens after a fire? So there are a couple of ways that ecosystem can undergo after a fire. So if the fire, uh, see, see, if the severity of the fire is not that high, it's a low severity, the ecosystem can uh, quickly recover back to, to its um, original state. But if the uh, severity is really high, there could be a mortality phase and also that even let some with the mortality, the some ecosystems are really resistant that they could uh, recover back to the original state, but it could take some time, but some ecosystem may not recover into the original state. So it could maybe during the recovery phase, there may be have additional disturbance and also the available resources may not enough for the recovery back into the original state. So it may can go um, different um, alternative states. So the first thing that we did to understand like the post-fire recovery trajectory in the Western US ecosystem. So we did this study for three different ecoregions. Uh, I'm only showing one here. So we did this one for the Southern Rockies, Pacific Northwest, as well as our Northern Rockies. So the, the I'm only showing here the Southern Rockies. So in the Southern Rockies, the, the data set that we used to understand the post-fire recovery trajectory is the uh, JLI data. So the Global Ecosystem Dynamic Investigation data. So it's a space one LIDAR data. And the reason that we use that one is that it's it provides structural data um, near global scale. So we thought that might be a good data set that we could understand the post-fire recovery uh, in a regional scale. But um, the JEDI data uh, delivered uh, start delivering the data from 2019. So um, if we want to have that recovery trajectory, then we need to go back in time. And um, so we, this study from all the fires in the forested ecosystems, um, Southern Rockies, Northern Rockies, and the Pacific Northwest, and the fires that we consider from 1985 to 2017. But we don't have JEDI data for the from 2000, 1985 to 2017. So what we could, we did was like we used the space for time or the chrono sequence approach. So if, uh, our assumption was like if the ecosystems, um, the similar conditions, the topographic conditions, and uh, as well as other forest conditions are the same, we could use um, the space. We can replace the space for the time. So our results show that. Uh, in the Southern Rockies, the recovery trajectory, this uh, the figure in the right shows the present canopy have a change compared to the unburnt area uh, nearby for the fires across different uh, fire severity gradients. The, the red line shows the high severity, blue line is the moderate severity, and the green line is the um, unburnt or uh, the low severity. So it shows that if it's the fire happens at uh, low to moderate severity conditions, it's easy to recover in the Southern Rockies. But if the fire happened in high severity, then it's really hard to recover. And even like after 30 years, it's very low, uh, the recovery. But it shows like, based on the trajectory, it shows like, like if let that ecosystem um, recover for maybe next 30, 40 years, based on the extrapolation of this trajectory, it might recover back into the original state. And what other thing that we found is that not only the time since fire, there are other factors also contribute to the um, post-fire recovery. Some of those factors are the fire size, the distance to receive sources, uh, drought conditions, the PEI is the um, measure in the drought conditions and also the topographic, topographic conditions. And so as I mentioned that based on our trajectory, it shows like it's in the Southern Rockies, uh, if time allows, the ecosystem may recover back into the original state. But this data that we analyze are structural data. It doesn't show anything about the species composition or anything. And so one thing that we thought about is that when we talk about that um, post-fire recovery, 
the, the images in the right side show two different things. One is the seedling, the top one it shows like ton of seedlings um, in one of the fire that we visited uh, last year. And um, the bottom image shows that the same fire at high elevations. Um, so it doesn't have any seedlings. So, but when we measure those conditions, especially the structural conditions, both would show the similar uh, pattern, but necessarily the first one actually shows the uh, recovery and regeneration, but the second one is not the recovery or regeneration. It's just a ton of shrubs that maybe potentially this, this region is not recovering, it may be cover, transition into something else. So, um, and so this is one of the study that uh, I saw on uh, Davis et al. in 2023 paper that talk about the seedling generation and the after post fire um, after a fire. So it shows that in high uh, in the figure on the left shows like uh, in high severity scenarios, what's the post fire recruitment probability? So if the fire severity is high, it's really low probability for the uh, seedling recruitment, and also some of the other factors that. Um, can uh, uh, control the seedling uh, region uh, trade, uh, recruitment probability shows in the right. So it's the distance of seed sources, mean tree cover, fire severity, and some of the other climatic controls like the climate water deficit. Likewise, so there are a ton of other conditions that site-wide conditions that can potentially impact and the uh, post-fire uh, seedling regeneration and the uh, seedling recruitment probability. However, this study was done with a ton of uh, uh, in-situ uh, field data, seedling counts, uh, plot level data. But we thought like it, it's really hard to like get a ton of like uh, field information, especially in the high elevation forest. Like it's really hard to get into those forests uh, and collect those data and say, have like information on where the seedling regeneration happens, what areas that we need to help uh, for the regeneration or if there's anything that we could probably provide the right framework, like if this ecosystem is not recovering, what else we could do? So it's really hard to get into some, physically get into some of those locations. So we thought might be a use, uh, drone remote sensing might be a good option that could potentially collect more information and can probably um, go align with the in-situ field data and um, that can cover larger areas than say, in little uh, field plots and can help to better understand the regeneration uh, after a fire in different ego regions. So in this one, what did, did we, um, again, this one basically happened in the Southern Rockies eco region. So we actually um, uh, visited 10 fires in the Southern Rockies eco, eco region that happens around um, 20 years ago. We choose 20 years ago because we want to let them ecosyst those ecosystem to show some signs of recovery or transformation so we could find that factors, what helps for the regeneration, what does not help for the regeneration. So we collect the drone uh, data, so the RGB images from the Phantom 4 drones. These draw drone images for like three centimeter resolution images that could, with the photogrammetry, a structure from motion, we could um, delineate individual shrubs, even like smaller shrubs, like with um, height about 50 centimeters. So we could, we were able to generate those individual um, uh, trees or shrubs and also its um, spatial locations. And then um, what we did, like we actually like uh, use uh, information from the drone images to classify uh, into different categories. So that we have eight different categories. So dead wood, the ground, herbs, live trees, rocks, seedlings, and shadows and shrubs. So why we had like all these different categories, because like our assumption was like in different site, micro site conditions might also uh, control the seedling recruitment and the regeneration. Uh, so most of the studies consider like the macro scale factors, the climatic factors, the um, and elevation and uh, topographic gradient, like uh, regional factors. But we thought like maybe there are some other site level micro site conditions that might also control the post fire regeneration. So this is our workflow in the right that we um, develop to understand that micro site conditions on the post fire seeding regeneration in the southern Rockies. So uh, in other study that it shows um, 
uh, not only like other climatic and topographic gradient factors, but also like the shrub density, deadwood density, standing dead density also like impact the seedling uh, regeneration in the, uh, especially in the high elevation areas. So this is uh, one figure that I'm showing the very um, right that uh, higher the shrub density, higher the seedling density in the Southern Rockies, especially at the high elevation forest. So in this feature, so this is still undergoing. So our next step for this one is to evaluate the post bioconfer regeneration strategies uh, against the microtopography and the site conditions. So in this one, like we are evaluating shrub density, standing dead density, and also some other microsite conditions. And so the, all these first two research that I talk about consider the fires that only burns only one times. But when we uh, take a look at the fire data set, this is from the VLT, the VLT combined fire data set. So if we come consider the fires um, from that data set, they combine like different data sources um, with the uh, fire records. And I only consider here the fires from 1985 to 2017. And it shows like some of the ecoregions in the West have uh, uh, fires that burn more than seven times. So what's the uh, recovery if the fire, if a region burns more than one time? So our preliminary, uh, so uh, preliminary, <coughs> excuse me, results show that some of the ecoregions in the Western uh, uh, US likes uh, uh, burn new areas, but some of the ecoregions in the Western US like uh, repeatedly burn. So this could be like, uh, forest turn into grass and the grass cycle helps more fires. It could be that reason, or maybe there are some other reasons that uh, potentially from it repeat fires and the new fires um, in those regions. So in this study that our next step is like to evaluate the carbon recovery with repeat fires. So in this one, we are planning to use JEDI and I said to combine the biomass density data and evaluate that uh, repeat fire uh, carbon recovery potential um, across ecoregions and also against plant functional types. Like So this uh, research was funded by series IRP. Um, so that's another research that I am um, doing. And so the, the other thing, like first thing I'm talk, I talk about the uh, fire and recovery. And the next one is that the fire and diversity, how that fire changed the diversity in forest ecosystems. So, uh, when, so when we talk about the diversity, we can measure time. Usually like we measure diversity based on taxonomic species composition, like those data, but also we can calculate the diversity in the same way um, using um, other metrics, the remote sense metrics. Um, so if we could uh, derive some of the uh, remote sense traits, then we could uh, use that traits in the same way that we could uh, calculate the different diversity matrices. So in this one, we have three different matrices, the functional divergence, functional evenness, and functional richness. So to calculate these three different uh, diversity indices, we use three different traits. One is the canopy height, one is the plant area index, and one is the uh, foliage height diversity. So we calculated this one uh, using airborne uh, full waveform LIDAR data. So and so once we have calculated this diversity, this is a figure that shows like the distribution of diversity across the world shed. So the first figure is the functional richness. The second one is the functional evenness. And then last one is the functional divergence. So you see like the distribution of um, this uh, functional diversity across the world shed is different. And so there may be some reasons why these um, diversity uh, indices uh, distribution varies within that um, eco region within that watershed. So like next steps are to see like what's the signature of this distribution of diversity across the watershed. So our research shows that the diversity, functional diversity uh, distribution within that watershed varies based on some of the other factors, especially the topographic gradient and also some other factors like uh, when we talk about the topographic gradients, especially the elevation and aspect change, the functional di diversity distribution within that watershed. And also we found that some of the other factors like distance to water, that also like change that distribution of the functional diversity within that watershed. And also we found that um, 
if there's a disturbance like fire happens, that also uh, changed that functional diversity. So we compared like four different fires that happened during uh, that happened at two di uh, four different time frames. Like one is like the very recent to the date of the airborne data that we collected, and one fire happened like uh, 18 years before that uh, the data was collected. Still, like we see like a difference between the functional diversity. Uh, of the burned and unburned side neighboring each other within those all uh, uh, four different fires. So it's, uh, so we see the uh, difference in the functional trace as well as the functional diversity. And we see like the uh, difference in the functional uh, diversity is higher than the difference in the functional traits alone. And so that was like a functional diversity. We um, did in a one uh, one watershed, but we thought like maybe we could use that same functional diversity uh, uh, idea to see like how that um, change the um, how can help that understand that um, first uh, the invasion. So in this study, we actually use the neon data. So we use neon field data and also neon airborne lidar data. So what we did like for all those neon uh, neon sites that represent the forested ecosystems that we calculated um, from the field data, we calculated like a different diversity, exotic and na native diversity matrices. And also we, from the airborne LIDAR data, we calculated a set of uh, diversity indices. And so the first two, uh, the, 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 uh, the left image shows that the uh, principal component analysis and the PC1, the first and second principal component analysis and how this, where, how the uh, native diversity matrix varies. Uh, across the neon sites, and the right figure shows that um, our uh, we calculated a ton of um, maybe 10 to any uh, airborne lidar based um, uh, diversity in indices, and see like how um, they vary across uh, neon sites. And also we use that's for the native diversity and the lidar diversity, and also we uh, you, uh, we have um, here calculated. Uh, from the field data, neon field data, like how that diversity, uh, the, the various uh, uh, invaded was not invaded. So in this one, it shows like there's a clear signal of uh, the diversity variation in the uh, native, uh, the invaded and the not invaded. So what our goal here is that whether we could use structural diversity signature that could tell us the invasion potential in these uh, sites uh, using uh, only the structural data. So we could potentially find out like based on the structural signatures whether this ecosystem is prone to invasion or not. So in this study, um, um, so our next step for this one is to find that signature of structural diversity and forest invasion in the Western US forest systems using uh, neon uh, airborne LIDAR. And so the last phase is the disturbance and ecosystem transformation. So all this like uh, fast things I talk about um, um, for the after disturbance, assuming that ecosystem is recovering, like what happens and how much, how long it will take and how we can um, recognize that recovery trajectory and how we can, what are the controls that might help or not help for that recovery trajectory. And the other thing is that there are, other than the recovery, some ecosystem may not recover, they may, come into a alternative state. So that so in this one, what we are trying to find is that using remote sense data, uh, the uh, the ecosystem transformation in the um, north central region. So in this one, what we are thinking about two different things: fire, invasive species, and climate. So they are like uh, very interconnected. And one reason, um, so there are uh, frequent uh, the fire number of fires, as I earlier mentioned, the number of fire increases, and then the area burned increases, and the repeat fire. There are a ton of repeat fire, also like some areas that have a ton of repeat fires happens too, and also like climate warming continues. So we want to see like how interconnect this one and see like where that invasion happens, and can we recognize this invasion with using remote sensing data before it actually happens. And the other thing is that in the climate data, we see like between past and future, the variability of climate records also varies. And so we want to, if we want a forest management perspectives, like we also need to adapt our forest, forest management practices based on these variabilities to help the ecosystems best.
So in this study, that, left, by the way, <clears throat> yeah. So in this study, like we have like a um, we measure this on state level ecoregion and the management polygon scale, and so our goal is to recognize invasion before it happens, and also like how that invasion changed the carbon storage on those ecosystems. So this is the preliminary uh, resource that we found, like in the Southern Rockies in the left two figures. So like the tree, uh, annual tree cover change in the Southern Rockies within the uh, last 30, 40 years, and also the annual grass shrub covers in the Southern Rockies. So they are completely opposite directions. One is going down and the one is like going up. And then in the last 10 years, like it's like a um, steady down in the tree cover. And so the figure in the right shows that the same thing, but had we did for the uh, seven states in the North Central region, Colorado, Kansas, Montana, North Dakota, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Wyoming. And so in this one, like what we are going to use that uh, first like derive the indicators of ecosystem transformations, and then um, find the location that transformation happened and use the remote sense data to recognize the threshold that would tell us that if this ecosystem is transforming. And then finally, to um, uh, and evaluate the carbon change due to this ecosystem transformation. So we have uh, identified several indicators from different remote sense data sets. So especially we are going to use the MODIS data for this one. And we had a workshop in last December, which showed we, uh, with the researchers and also stakeholders to identify uh, the locations of transformation and potential causes for the transformation in those locations. And we are going to use that information as also the remote sense information to identify the vegetation stability and also vegetation sensitivity to fire and climate. With those data, we are going to develop the ecosystem vulnerability index, and that would help us to, uh, to map in the regional scale for the whole North Central region, like which areas that are vulnerable to transformed in the next, uh, maybe next decade or so. And with the JRI data, we are going, we see like clear signals of the biomass change in the burned and unburned. And so then the right figure shows like the what's the current biomass in this um, at the state level. But what we are going to use that we are going to make a connection with the time series data of the MODIS and Sentinel data and the JRI biomass data to develop time series of biomass data. That would help us to uh, understand the uh, change uh, of the uh, biomass as a result of ecosystem transformations. And also, finally, like we want to link these transformations to the uh, management practices. So the, whether it's treated, untreated, if it's treated, like what type of treatments happens and how that helps to recover the biomass in these uh, areas. So in this one, there are five steps, like find locations where the uh, when location is vulnerable to future transformation and what's the impact on carbon storage. So with that, I want to conclude that my uh, the research that I talk about, uh, these are the basic conclusions from all these things, that disturbance frequency and intensity increases, and also the disturbance decreases the carbon storage. And most of the studies that I did are from the fires. But... Um, there, there will be other signatures that we might need to have more research. And also some ecosystems like repeat fires, some are not, and why that happens. And so it's also needs some attention. And, um, and also it's uh, really critically important to identify areas that uh, transformations happens and then why that happens and how we can help. With that, um, I wanna finish my talk with uh, these questions. Uh, for you, that would probably help us to improve our research. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nayani, for an excellent presentation. Um, we have two minutes left for um, questions. Um, one came in um, during your talk. Mm -hmm. Hi, Nayani, based on your experience in using JEDI data for analyzing height changes, was the noise in Jedi LiDAR so high that it overshadowed the signal in height changes due to fire? Did you use only the nighttime data as daytime data may have more noise? And I was curious about how you dealt with ground detection in areas with dense canopies. Yeah, so in this one, we use the daytime data and also we use some of the quality flags that uh, Jedi data comes with to have like only the high quality data. And um, so, um, we didn't consider anything dense versus um, 
uh, not dense. We only consider what it comes at the seas. Um, but we instead of the, not we. So one thing we did, we did not use only the canopy height. We used the other two data sets, uh, to the two other uh, indices, um, the JEDI data calculus, plant area index, and the foliage height diversity as well. So that were final conclusions. We um, we developed the trajectory with all three different indices. And so our final conclusion based on combination of all three. So the foliage height diversity uh, can uh, probably uh, uh, recognize the different densities within the canopy. And the one other thing that when we do this research, so um, because the Jedi cannot uh, recognize some of the seedlings that are very short, so that was the drawback in this one. So that's why we move into the drone data to see like how much um, carbon or the trajectory that we have missed because the Jedi cannot recognize that one. Great, thank you very much. Well, thank you both Nayani and Ariana for your excellent talks. Um, um, we look forward to uh, seeing you again and um, any further questions we'll uh, be sure to send to you via email. Thanks everyone. I, I put a couple of notes in the chat, but we if you're interested in fire and remote sensing, please join us for a data skills webinar later in March. And then we've got our next edition of science seminar series Again, second Tuesday in April. So we hope to see you for those. Thanks again for two excellent presentations. We appreciate you very much and have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you all. Bye-bye.